picked up by business in the 60s and particularly by Royal Dutch Shell and they developed a, a strategy group that started thinking about what are the things that might happen in the future. Not trying to predict what will happen but what might happen. And one of the things they imagined was a, a rise in oil prices. At the time oil prices were low and all the oil companies were behaving as if they'd stay low. Um, Shell strategists said well that might be but if oil prices went up we'd really be caught off guard. So we better think about what to do. And when they presented that argument to their board, the board said, well, that, that's all very interesting, but it's very improbable. So we won't do anything about it. The strategists went back and said, well, that's not good enough because we've been thinking about this a lot and, and we can see what might happen. So then they developed some really vivid, detailed stories about what the future might look like if oil prices went up. And they went and told those stories to their managers as a way of essentially putting them in the future. And that didn't sort of suddenly change the company overnight, but what they claim it did was emotionally prepared them for change. So they had at least contemplated that the world could change and when oil prices did go up in the early 70s, Shell was able to act faster than anyone else and they became one of the leading oil companies as a result. They didn't predict it, they didn't have future, um, perfect um, foresighting, but they had contemplated a possibility that as others hadn't contemplated. And so scenario planning has developed from there. Um, this is the sort of approach that's used. You identify the question that you're wanting to ask, and quite often you get that wrong first time and you have to come back to it. You ask yourself what sort of things might influence the future. You draw on the past, you think about what lessons you can learn from the past and what trends seem to be emerging now, but you also need to add a dose of imagination because there are no facts about the future. And this is where a lot of people find scenario planning a difficult concept because they love to think we're, we're making our decisions based on facts. And um, I'll give you an example of a moment, in a moment of why that's a huge fallacy. So a, dose of, a mixture of facts and imagination. Um, then ask yourself which of those things that might happen in the future would, potentially would have the biggest impact on us and are the most uncertain. Because they're the things we want to tell our stories about. And then you use storytelling or scenario development, not just as a bit of fun, but as a really critical way to test your logic. Because if you try and write a story and put all the bits together, you'll soon find out if your logic's not right. And then if you go and try and tell that story to people, it gives people a chance to say, well, hang on a sec, you haven't explained how that could happen. So that's what scenario planning's about. And then you ask yourself, well, given those possibilities, what would I need to do to prepare for one or more of those futures? So it's a rigorous process, but it is based partly on imagination, and a lot of us feel uncomfortable about imagination. Those of you who come from an arts background, of course, won't, won't feel at all uncomfortable about that. You'll say, bring it on, we need more imagination. But the scientists will say, well, you know, not sure about imagination. Hmm. Um, what we're essentially doing is focusing on that bottom left-hand corner, trying to look at the possibilities. And in doing so, we reduce our vulnerability to surprise. Very powerful way to deal with complexity. And it doesn't require us understanding the complexity. In fact, it means we're embracing the complexity and saying, well, it could go a number of different ways. And I've thought of many of them. Now, here's a, an example of a project that, that I was involved with with the United Nations and why um, you can't just do these. So have a look at what's happened in the world in the past, particularly what's happened to our ecological systems. What impact has that had on human being? What might happen in the future and what impact might that have? And how might we respond? So the main part of the Millennium Assessment was about analysing data from the past. And the rule, the, the overriding rule that that part of the assessment had was we only use information that has been verified and peer reviewed. So not speculating, it's based on good solid data. But when it came to the group that was looking at the future, of course they relaxed that rule um, and they said, well, we need to add some imagination in here. Now what happened in this, um, now you can see the, uh, the bottom axis here. Um, I'll, I'll come back to what that is in a moment. But the process that was gone into here was we sat down and we said, what are the sorts of things that might influence us in the future? So we talked about things like pollution and water shortage and food shortage and climate change and uh, storms and species dying and, um, and pests and disease. 
and then we said, out of all of that, um, are there a, f a small number of things that are really more important than everything else? And two things came out. One was um, this bottom axis, which is whether the world gets more or less connected. Because we said, all of those things um, can be dealt with much better if we're connected and we're cooperating than if we're fragmented and not cooperating. And the other thing was whether environmental policy was proactive or re reactive, because we said a lot of things that could happen, like climate change, um, we could deal with that if we started early, but if we waited until the problem had arisen, it would be too late and we'd have the sort of problems we're facing now. So that were the two dimensions, and then we went in and we told stories in each of those four combinations. So for example, global orchestration is a world where we're highly connected, we're all cooperating, so we could really deal well with things like SARS or a, a flu pandemic, but we're reactive. And so climate change would be a difficulty for us because we would only react after we saw the problem. And so we use these stories to say to policymakers around the world, these are the risks that you're taking if you're too reactive um, and, and if you're not cooperative or if you are cooperative. Um, now, for each of those then, we told vivid stories and we had artists paint pictures. <clears throat> we didn't actually compose any music as far as I'm, con I'm aware, but we probably should have. Um, and so we were able to tell these stories about the, world, the way the world, particularly the, the poor world and the rich world, comparing them, might emerge under these different conditions in the future. The interesting thing was though, we had a group of modelers there, quantitative modelers, um, who only used facts. And they came up with the most bizarre predictions for the future because, for example, they predicted population would, grow, would increase. That would mean we'd use more water. We'd plant more areas to food, to feed ourselves. But they had no way of knowing how that would stop. When would we actually run out of water? Um, when would we end up having so much food that we didn't have enough natural vegetation to filter water or control pests um, or prevent erosion? And they had no way of knowing how people would react as those trends emerged. So they came up with these really fanciful predictions of the future, whereas those of us that were using our flawed imaginations were actually coming up with much more realistic ideas about what might happen because we were able to factor in the way humans might react. And to me that really underpinned or underlined why it is a fallacy to think we can deal with complexity and the future just with facts. We've got to throw in imagination and experience. Anyway, I'm sounding like a preacher now, so I'll, I'll stop. I just put this in to show you that Shell and other companies have continued to develop scenarios looking at the key issues, and these are the ones they came up in 2006. Um, September 11 had happened, and uh, Enron had collapsed, so they were worried about security and market trusts. Their most recent ones are about oil depletion and um, climate change. Now there's another field that comes out of all of this called strategic foresight, which is really, really deeply metaphysical and um, I'm by no means familiar with it. But if you're interested in that particular area, um, if you go to some of these references, you can start to read about it. Um, it's a fascinating area, but sort of well beyond my tiny brain. <coughs> now I just want to say something quickly about resilience, because this is a word that, ke that keeps coming up. Um, you'll hear it talked about in terms of the resilience of young people. Um, the resilience of communities after the bushfires in Victoria, the resilience of ecosystems to climate change, uh, and the resilience of Australia as a nation. Um, in a sense, this word resilience is a way of saying um, we don't really know what's going to happen in the future. We don't really know what we're going to have to, what challenges we're going to have to face. So maybe the best thing we can do is build our ability to deal with a whole range of things. So it's a really good, feel-good sort of concept, and everyone's using it now, sometimes as a way to avoid doing anything. Um, this is an example of the, the most important bit of environmental policy at the moment, caring for our country. Its goal is all these things, and resilient ecosystems, and it's got all these different components that it's going to deal with. So that's just an example of a policy that's really focusing on resilience. But many people don't stop to think, what is this thing? What how, do, how can we put it into practice? So there's, been, there's a lot of people have been thinking about it. And there's one group called the Resili Resilience Alliance that's really been getting deeply into thinking about how you 
think about resilience in practice. Um, this is the definition they've come up with. So you can see it's about absorbing disturbances, it's about reorganising, it's about changing but still coming back to the same sort of identity and function. So if you think about it in terms of personal resilience, when you have a tragedy, um, you get over it, but you're never quite the same person. You wouldn't, it would be unrealistic to expect that you would come back to being exactly the same as you were before. And in the same way, it's unrealistic to think that any system would never change. But resilience is about coming back to roughly the same sort of system. Now, these are some of the things that you need to have resilience. You need to have a diversity of ideas and diversity of people and skills. You need to be connected, open, sharing ideas. You need to think ahead so you can respond quickly. You need to have spare capacity.